Do you like scary movies? If you're a fan of horror, there have probably been quite a few times where you found yourself yelling at the movie screen, don't go up to the attic, don't split up, don't check out the noise in the basement, run out the front door. You know the characters can't hear you, but when the story is engaging enough to make you care about their well-being, you can't help but try and give them a hand. After all, you'd want someone to save you from a machete-wielding maniac stalking through a summer camp you took up your new counselor job at. If someone was watching you hide in the closet, listening for a masked killer's footsteps with a kitchen knife in your hand, you'd want them to give you a heads up when the killer was getting ready to chop through the door with an axe. Of course, the characters in your favorite movies never listen, because, you know, that's how movies work. But in 1985, a young man returned a VHS tape entitled Return of the Suburb Slasher to his local video store with a peculiar complaint. The main character of the movie stopped mid-action to look at the camera and beg for his help. The video store clerk laughed him off and refused to give him a refund, though he did eventually give in and offer store credit after the man began to cry. He decided to take the tape home and watch it, just to see what all the fuss was about. After all, he'd never seen someone cry at a horror movie like that. So he sat down on his favorite beanbag chair, pushed the tape into the VCR, and pressed play. Apparently, his shell-shocked customer had at least remembered to be kind and rewind. The movie told the story of Heather Campbell, a young woman planning to host a party at her family's home in a classic suburban cul-de-sac while her parents were out of town. In equally classic slasher fashion, this party would take place on the 10th anniversary of a series of grisly murders in the same neighborhood, committed by the mysterious suburb slasher. As the party kicks off with loud music, teenage debauchery, and lots of drinking out of red plastic cups, the killer appears to pick off the group of friends one by one. Like other classic slasher victims, your Michaels and your Jasons, the suburb slasher also covers their face, wearing a black burlap sack over their head that masks all identifiable features. The first 90 minutes of the movie were fun but basic. A canoodling couple gets decapitated here, an unnecessary shower scene is cut short by a stabbing there, the sort of thing you'd expect. But at about 97 minutes in, something impossible happened. Heather walked into the living room, finding her friend's dead body strewn across it, and let out a scream that measured up to the bests in the genre. The teen scream queen then began to run as the killer appeared to chase her. She made her way into the basement of the house, locked the door behind her, then she turned to the camera, tears in her eyes, shirt spattered with blood and said, Hey mister, I don't know you, and I don't know why you've just sat there watching this without doing nothing, but please, I'm begging you, help me out here, what can I do to survive this? At first the clerk thought he was under the influence of some mind-altering substance, but the only things in his system were popcorn and store brand soda. Now this was really happening. He stared open mouthed at the screen, where Heather watched him expectantly. He was too stunned to speak. After a moment of silence, Heather sighed dejectedly, shaking her head, and turned back toward the stairs. She slowly walked back to the basement door, unlocked it, and pulled it open. There the killer was waiting with his expressionless burlap mask. The clerk's eyes widened and he cried out, NO! But it was too late. The film suddenly cut to black, and with a whirring sound, the VCR spat the tape back out. The clerk sat there, staring at the tape. What could he do with it? Should he make a copy, send it to someone else and pass the curse along? Should he try to watch it again? He wasn't sure he could bear to see Heather looking at him with those same pleading eyes. Then he remembered an ad he had seen in the back of his favorite comic book. Seen something you can't explain? A brush with the unknown keeping you up at night. We're looking for stories of the strange and unusual. Write to us now. Maybe they could do something he couldn't. He put the tape back into its cover, placed it in an envelope, and mailed it off the next day. A few days later, the package reached its intended recipient, an undercover branch of the SCP Foundation tracking anomalous activity via a series of ads in comic books and video stores to tap into one of the most underutilized resources in the world, nerds. The tape was designated SCP-5733, and Heather and the Mass Killer were designated SCP-5733-2 and SCP-5733-1, respectively. After an initial viewing confirmed its anomalous properties, a research team headed by Dr. Carpenter began to perform a series of tests. 
Testing was open to all Foundation employees, subject to approval by Dr. Carpenter. Approved personnel would be placed in the Site-73 multi-purpose room with a VHS player and a television. The staff member would then watch the movie and attempt to engage with Heather and help her escape. For the first test, D-Class 1973 was selected. When Heather turned to the camera and asked for help, he asked if she had a car. When she confirmed that yes, she did, he instructed her to sneak back upstairs, find her car keys, leave through the back door, and drive as fast and as far away as possible. She successfully retrieved the car keys, but when she reached the car, she saw that the tires had been slashed. Heather began to panic, but 1973 talked her through it, telling her to smash the window of a neighbor's car and unlock the door. She complied, and 1973 instructed her on how to hotwire the vehicle. The car started, and with a triumphant laugh, she sped out of the cul-de-sac. Just as her car began to pull away, the killer emerged from the back seat, wielding a kitchen knife. Heather screamed, and the tape cut to black. For the next test, D-Class 1944 was selected. He began by telling Heather to find her father's shotgun, seen earlier in the film, and use it to take out the killer before they could get to her. She snuck up to her parents' room and found the gun, only for the killer to appear in the doorway behind her. She aimed the gun and fired, but nothing happened. The killer opened their hand, dropping the shotgun shells on the floor. She was close, but the killer was one step ahead. She screamed as they approached with the knife, and again, the tape cut to black. After several tests were conducted with D-Class subjects and no adverse effects were reported, aside from the obvious trauma of failing to save Heather's life, testing was opened up to all Foundation staff. Assistant researcher Felissa Baker volunteered. She believed her extensive knowledge of the slasher genre would give her the tools to help Heather strategize. After speaking with Heather about her skills, which mainly included party planning and babysitting, Felissa determined that Heather should seek outside help. With Felissa's help, Heather made her way out of the house and over to the home of her next-door neighbor, Mr. Loomis. When she got there, the door was open and the lights were off. It didn't look great, but she didn't really have much of a choice but to go inside. She made her way to the bedroom where Mr. Loomis and his wife were lying in bed. She tried to wake him, but the camera zoomed in to reveal his throat had been slashed. The shape in the bed next to him sat up and was not in fact his wife, but the suburb slasher instead. As the figure raised their signature kitchen knife, the screen went to black. SCP-5733 became a competition of sorts among Foundation staff. Each volunteer proposing their knowledge would help them get Heather to safety. Assistant researcher Nick Younglin Doskowitz proposed telling Heather to call for help, giving her a secret phone number for the SCP Foundation circa 1983, the time in which the movie was set. However, when Heather reached the phone, it had been destroyed, smashed to pieces. Next to it was a note written in blood that said, The only foundation here is fear. Then the killer appeared behind Heather, and the tape went to black. Somehow the killer knew about the SCP Foundation. Perhaps in a manner of speaking, the call was coming from inside the house. Next, field agent Malcolm Pleasance and Donald McDowell were selected due to their extensive knowledge of hand-to-hand -hand combat. They attempted to teach Heather various fighting and self-defense techniques, while she survived on the limited supplies available in the basement. She eventually left the basement, and when the killer appeared, began to fight them. After 23 minutes of combat, she knocked the slasher to the floor and grabbed the candlestick to finish them off. As the agents watching began to celebrate, a second version of the suburban slasher appeared behind her, lunging forward. Just before the new killer made contact, the tape cut to black. During this test, the slasher seemed more adept at combat than it had been before, as though it could hear the advice being given to Heather. With other techniques failing, field agent Tilda Joan Bennett was brought in for a test, selected due to her expertise in thaumaturgy. She instructed Heather on basic offensive and defensive thaumaturgy, before guiding her out of the house and into the front yard. When the slasher appeared brandishing their knife, Heather was able to sign a protective glyph and defend against the knife's blow. She followed this with a wind spell that pushed the killer further away. Heather began to run down the driveway, making a break for survival, when the slasher suddenly performed a freeze spell that rendered her unable to move. Heather's wide, panicked eyes stared down the barrel of the camera in a silent scream as the killer approached her, recovered the knife in hand before the tape went to black. Eventually, Dr. Carper volunteered to conduct a test. He instructed his research team to prepare a list of options for Heather's survival, divided into four categories. What to take from the basement, where to go once leaving the basement, how to exit the house, 
and how to escape the cul-de-sac. He was not informed about any of these options, but rather had them printed out and placed into plastic bowls on the day of the test. There were also three cards created and placed face down, reading face, body, and legs. When Heather addressed Dr. Carpenter, he informed her that he would be randomly selecting instructions for her, and asked that she follow them exactly. The first slip of paper instructed Heather to grab a pair of garden shears from the basement and climb the stairs back into the main house. Next, she was told to go upstairs to the bedroom, then downstairs into the dining room. She complied and there was no sign of the killer so far. Third, Dr. Carpenter told Heather to run back upstairs, out of the bedroom window, onto the roof, and then jump down into the garden. Then it was time for the next step. He told Heather to jump over the fence into the neighbor's garden and run down the street until she could find help. As Heather made her way down the road, the slasher broke through the front door of her house but did not chase after her. Heather continued running down the road for 20 minutes as the trees and lights began to dwindle. The surroundings began to grow darker and darker until they resembled a void. Dr. Carpenter instructed her to keep walking. She could make out lights and houses in the distance. She ran toward the neighborhood, but stopped suddenly and began to panic. She was back in her own neighborhood, in front of her own house, and the killer was waiting for her. As Heather demanded to know what to do, Carpenter flipped over one of the three cards. It read, Face, and so he told Heather to attack the killer's face with the shears, then the killer's legs, then his body. The killer dodged her attack, grabbed the shears, and pushed her to the ground. As Heather looked up at the killer, his face could be seen through the torn sack. It was Dr. Carpenter. Heather screamed, and the tape cut to black. Talk about a third act twist. The movie itself did not create the killer, but somehow the viewer did, and it also made the killer more creative. After this incident, all testing on SCP-5733 was suspended, and attempts to help turn Heather from victim to survivor were halted. Searching for answers, the Foundation looked into Crystal Elms Productions, the production company listed on the videotape's cover. No record of the production company, the film, or any of its cast could be found. Several months after testing on SCP-5733 was suspended, another tape was found. Because, let's face it baby, these days you've gotta have a sequel. The new tape was titled, The Suburb Slasher Strikes Again and was purported to be produced by Crystal Elms Productions in 1985. It was designated SCP-6733. Unlike its predecessor, this tape was only tested once. A member of D-Class personnel was first shown SCP-5733 up until the point where it becomes anomalous, and was then shown SCP-6733. He was left completely alone in order to watch the contents of the tape. The following was what was on it. Dr. Malcolm Baines entered the testing chamber to find D-1974, or Jamie, sitting across from the television set. He introduced himself and ran a series of cognitive tests. He asked Jamie what he thought of the film and he said, eh, It was pretty much your standard slasher film. There's a group of teens who just graduated high school and go to a local camping site by a lake to celebrate. One of them mentions it's near the site where the killer, the slasher, was shot dead by police a year prior after a rampage. Dr. Baines clarified, asking if this was a reference to the first film. Jamie continued, It's not really clear, they all think it's a joke, apart from the main girl. She said her dad's a police officer and she's seen video evidence of the attack. No one references any of the characters from the first film though, and they don't show up in this one either. The slasher's the only constant. According to Jamie, the main events of the film revolved around a lakeside camping trip and quickly began to go wrong. Dr. Baines inquired about the nature of the slasher's kills, and Jamie elaborated, He's still got a kitchen knife, same weapon as the first film, so he stabs a lot of them. It's pretty gory for the time it was made. He slashes up someone's face, then the nerdy guy gets stabbed through the eye. That one's pretty good. The camera gets sprayed with blood. One of the teens gets his head crushed wide open. Dr. Baines asked Jamie how the scenes made him feel, and he responded, Like, there's some good jump scares and the tension's fairly high at points, but it's a little dated. I've seen scarier, but I've also seen worse horrors. Only one part of the film stood out to him. He described it. So, the girl and her best friend, the one that's been looking out for her this whole time, enter into a cellar. The slasher creeps up from behind and grabs the friend, tears his head clean off his neck. The slasher then chases the other teen to the other side of the lake. He's advancing on her. The camera's set on the water of the lake. It's a wide shot. You've got the lake water line parallel to the top and bottom of the shot, so it splits the screen horizontally. She's fallen over, crawling away from him. As he advances on her, the camera zooms in. Slowly, though. It takes its time, and he does too. 
There's music at the start of the scene, like deep, dark synths. The stops as the camera moves closer though. I forgot to say, it's, it's a long scene, longer than five minutes. Maybe it was ten? I don't know, it felt longer than ten. So the slasher's approaching her. We're, the viewers, approaching the shore. And then the music stops, and it's just his footsteps and her pleading. And, and she's pleading, man, she's... There's these big inhales of breath stifled by the mucus running out of her nose. She's babbling, but it gets to the point she's not even saying words, just making noise. As Jamie continued, he began to grow increasingly distressed. The camera's real close to the shore now, and the slasher stops. He turns his head and looks straight at the camera. You can't see his eyes, but you know he's looking straight at you. And he just stands there, staring. Eventually, the girl crawls out of the frame, or the camera zooms past her, I, I can't remember which. It just keeps zooming in on his face. Where his face should be under the hood, the girl keeps screaming off camera, and then there's this guttural ripping noise, and the screaming stops. It just stops, but the camera keeps moving. You can see the individual droplets of blood splashed across him. You can see the fabrics that make up his hood. His face soon takes up the entire shot, and then... black. No credits or nothing, the tape just cuts to black and was pushed out of the player. Dr. Baines pushed a bit, asking if there was anything anomalous he could be forgetting. Then Jamie thought of something. The girl, her friends, all of them, I, I don't think they had names. Jamie became increasingly disturbed by the film over time, calling Dr. Baines into his dormitory to ask him if they had shown him a snuff film. After falling asleep, he had a vivid dream of the lake, crawling alongside it recalling the deaths of his friends at the hand of a masked killer. When he woke up, he saw a shadow outside the window of his room. It stood there, silent and unmoving, all night. It only vanished when the sun came up. The next night, surveillance caught the image of a humanoid shape running through the forest, but the guards found no trace of it. Dr. Baines returned to Jamie's cell to find him deeply distressed. He repeated over and over that the slasher was coming for him. Dr. Baines dismissed this concern. Once Jamie was alone, he stared into the mirror as the temperature began to drop. You're here, aren't you? He said. A gloved hand punctured through the mirror, spraying glass everywhere. On the other side, there he was, the suburb slasher. Jamie fled his dormitory and ran for his life as the slasher followed him. Security officer Lauren confronted the slasher, but they lifted him up by the neck and stabbed the familiar kitchen knife through his head. Jamie continued to make his way through the facility the slasher following and leaving a trail of destruction and bodies in his wake. Then, he reached Dr. Baines, who was confused by his behavior. Dr. Baines insisted that he needed to get to the basement, but terrified, Jamie resisted him. The two men scuffled, and Jamie shoved Dr. Baines hard, sending him careening into the wall. A lighting rig fell from the ceiling, landing on Dr. Baines. Several strangers ran into the room, calling for a medic on set, and asking for production and lighting to come back and reset everything. Off screen, a director yelled, CUT! The slasher's face appeared, taking up the entirety of the camera, and the tape cut to black. This version of the tape's events was created after the tape was watched by D1888 in a testing session with Dr. Carpenter. There has never been a Dr. Baines in the SCP Foundation's employ. Somehow, this second tape creates a localized destabilization of reality. It is unknown how many times it has actually been tested. So be careful what horror rentals you decide to watch. You might just find yourself in the middle of the action, and no matter what you think you know about surviving a slasher film, there will be no escape. You can run, but you certainly can't hide. Now go check out Frightening Lost Ronald Reagan VHS Tape You Must Watch, SCP-1981 and SCP-095, and SCP-5094 Miss J's WizKid Schoolhouse for more mysterious media SCPs.